Work of Women Peace Builders is a coalition of over 120 women's groups and civil society organizations in more than 40 countries experiencing violent conflict and humanitarian crises. We amplify diverse women voices, promote their full, equal and meaningful participation and support their work to build just, inclusive and sustainable peace. Through our strategies, programs and partnerships, GNWP implements United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 in supporting resolutions on women, peace and security in synergy with the youth peace and security agenda, sustaining peace resolutions, and international frameworks on peace, gender equality, and sustainable development. Real change happens when diverse local women's voices are heard and they influence decision making in their communities. This is why GNWP pioneered the localization of women, peace and security resolution strategy. Localization has achieved numerous tangible impacts. In Cauca, Colombia, the adoption of local action plans helped implement the peace agreement and strengthened response to sexual and gender based violence throughout the creation of gender patrol. In the Kalinga province in the Philippines, localization led to women's inclusion in a historically all male Bodong Council, a traditional court and peace building mechanism. In the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, women were recognized as arbiters of conflicts. In Amoria, Kitsbun, and other local districts in Uganda, Localization led to the establishment of gender desks in police stations, the appointment of community liaison officers, and increased the awareness and re reporting of sexual and gender-based violence crimes. GNWP also promotes women-led and localized humanitarian response. One week after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, GNWP convened the first civil society discussion to hear directly from local women and youth peace builders on their needs. In partnership with local women's groups, GNWP distributed cash assistance, food, psychological support, and other essential services to local communities. Our trainings with local leaders facilitated the formation of support networks for survivors of conflict-related sexual violence and other war crimes. GNWP pays a special attention to enhancing young women's leadership. Our Young Women Plus Leaders for Peace YWL program builds on the synergies between the Women, Peace and Security and Youth, Peace and Security agendas to enable young women to gain the skills and confidence to become leaders in their communities. Hikalks Bazaar, Bangladesh. GNWP's Young Women Leaders Network teaches literacy and numeracy classes to Rohingya refugees. They implement economic empowerment projects to increase local income. They also produce radio shows for peace and organize community theater activities to promote dialogues. In Afghanistan, GNWP provides immediate humanitarian relief to local communities and advocates for the reversal of the Taliban's anti-woman policies. As complex global challenges to peace and security evolve, it is more critical than ever to ensure that local women's voices are heard and their perspectives are valued and integrated in all decision-making processes. The global network of women peace builders is committed to advancing institutional and cultural narrative shifts to transform beliefs, break down oppressive systems, and realize our vision of gender equality and peace for all. Good morning, colleagues. Bon matin à tous et à toutes. Buenos dias and uh, ça va faire. 
Welcome to the localization of women, peace, and security in Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Papua New Guinea, and Yemen. We are very, very pleased to be able to gather today in person and online to celebrate and showcase some of the best practices and lessons learned that we have had in the four countries inspired by GNWP's longstanding relationship with local partners and our pioneering of the localization of women, peace and security strategy supported and in collaboration with the US State Department's office, uh, Secretary of State's office for global women's issues of which we have our excellency here this morning. We are also grateful to the Cameron Ministry of Promotion of Women and Family who has joined us as a co-host and has opened and embraced the localization strategy in Cameroon. Now colleagues, we're going to open uh, the discussion here with some opening remarks and to hear and learn more about the She Wins Initiative from the GWE, uh, from GWE. And so without further ado, it is my honor to welcome your, your Excellency, Gita Rao Gupta, the Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues from the US Department of State, Secretary's Office on Global Women's Issues. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you so much, and good morning to all of you. Thank you, Katrina, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. It's been a busy week. We're on the last day of this week. I know we've all been in back-to-back -back meetings, uh, but this is exciting for us to be together in the 68th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. I know you, we're all pretty exhausted. I have to say upfront that, unfortunately, I may have to leave a little early, only because of this back-to-back -back meeting, so I apologize in advance for that, but I have to say I'm incredibly inspired. That video was great um, and ever more motivated than uh, before to truly achieve gender equality with all of you. Uh, thank you to the Global Network for Women Peace Builders for bringing us together today and for your work to advance gender equality globally through your localized methods and partnerships. I think um, working with local communities to come up with local solutions is really the only way to bring about change. Um, we have for far too long done this, tried to do this at the national level, but there's no question that it's within communities that the change has to occur. And so I'm really grateful for this emphasis on localization. So I should say that as ambassador at large for global women's issues at the Department of State, our office's mandate is to promote the rights and empowerment of women and girls as a cornerstone of US foreign policy, which includes um, the tools that we have available to us, which are public, bilateral, and multilateral diplomacy and foreign assistance programming. There are three specific policy priorities that we focus our efforts on. The first is women, peace, and security, gender-based violence, and women's economic security. And that has constituted the basis for our office's focus since its establishment in 2009. Um, recognizing the reality of the world we live in today and how it evolves, we also address some cross-cutting issues, such as climate change and technology-facilitated gender-based violence, which increasingly is affecting a lot more women leaders and is being talked about a lot in this particular gathering um, at the Commission on the Status of Women. We've heard this issue being raised by women leaders in many sessions. Um, SGV, as we are called affectionately, cannot and does not do this work alone. We, we're too small within the US government, within the Department of State. So a, care, a core component of our mandate is really to build the Department of State's institutional capacity to integrate gender equality across all of our efforts which includes training our personnel, providing technical expertise, and developing operational policies. Uh, the learning from our programming, work like the global network is leading, serves as a source of evidence-based approaches uh, to much of our gender integration efforts at the department. So you get cited often as examples of how this can be done right. Um, additionally, one of our key guiding principles in our recent 2023 WPS Strategy and action, National Action Plan, and in our 2022 US Strategy to Prevent and Respond to Gender-Based Violence uh, globally is localization. 
That's a key principle. Um, we recognize that the integration and elevation of local voices and the leadership of women and girls is essential for effective WPS implementation and for addressing gender-based violence. Such approaches generate, as I said, local buy-in, legitimacy, and sustainability in peace and security processes. Effectively, supporting such processes requires us within the US government to root our programming, our policy, and funding, and to incorporate within what we do, local understanding. Um, so this global network of women peace builders is a vital partner then to help us realize this principle through our work, uh, through our supporting her empowerment, women for inclusive new security project that's called the She Wins Project. Um, that project is breaking cycles of conflict and promoting peaceful and secure nations. And it does so by creating the space for local women leaders, organizations, and communities to be included and to exercise their agency in peace processes within Cameroon, the DRC, Yemen, and Papua New Guinea. She Wins is one of our flagship initiatives at SGV. And I would like to share a little bit more about its focus and uh, how the Global Network for Women Peace Builders has played a remarkable role within it. She Wins was announced um, at the 2021 Summit for Democracy, and it's scheduled to go through 2026, meaning that this event actually couldn't come at a better time for reflecting on what works. Together with your partner, Search for Common Ground, uh, GNWP builds the capacity of local-led organizations in preventing, resolving, and recovering from conflict, violent extremism, and GBV. What that means is that the network maps key actors impacted by and who are well positioned to address violence, which includes local civil society, organizations, and diverse community members. Uh, the network analyzes current national and local policies and women's participation in governance structures and decision-making bodies. It tracks the status of WPS efforts and examines the barriers that women face in peace building as a result of intersecting crises across the globe. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the network connects local women peace leaders to the broader global context and critical decision-making processes. So for example, just last month, I had the privilege of meeting a local partner from Papua New Guinea, Lily, and I understand she's not here, is her daughter here? I was told that her daughter is here. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're the, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful to see you here. I had a chance to talk to Lily at our WPS uh, Implementers Workshop in DC, and hearing directly from her empowers me with the knowledge and stories that I can use to advance the WPS agenda within the Department of State and externally with other partners. Um, so that is the important context about why I want to be here today, why I am here to support the global network of women peace builders. But why should all of us take the work beyond this room, especially when there are so many crises? You know, the world is facing the greatest number of conflicts uh, since World War II right now. The truth is that women around the world continue to face tremendous challenges and barriers that at times seem insurmountable. The UN's Gender Snapshot 2023 warns that if current trends continue, over 340 million women and girls, an estimated 10% of the world's female population, will live in extreme poverty by 2030. In addition, the number of women and girls in conflict-affected contexts has risen significantly, in 2022 reaching 614 million girls and women. 50% higher than the number in 2017. While the global challenges and transnational threats we face have drastically changed over the years, our approaches to achieving stability must continue to evolve and be informed by the needs and perspectives of local communities and of local women and girls. The recent tribal warfare in the Enga province in Papua New Guinea has resulted in dozens of deaths and new levels of mistrust that are fueling cycles of violence. But Lily's organization, Voices for Change, is in contact with the tribal leaders, 
offering support and safety for the women impacted by the violence. She's further looking to facilitate peace dialogue sessions between key local leaders, politicians, and decision makers in the community. That's the kind of action, outreach, and community trust building that we require. It is Lily's work, it's the network's, network's work, and I'm proud to say it's also the US government's work that makes this all happen. The Biden-Harris administration, you should know, is attributing a record $2.6 billion in fiscal year 2023 foreign assistance to advance gender equality, which doubles our prior commitment, our prior year's commitment. And fiscal year 2024 budget request includes a record $3.1 billion in funding for gender equality. So it's an enormous commitment by President Biden and this administration to advance gender equality. In my office, though we have a relatively small foreign assistance budget, in just the past year, 95 human rights organizations, of which 70 were women's organizations, were trained and supported with SGV foreign assistance. For all of you, it's not just money, though money of course matters. Um, another way we are responding to heightened levels of conflict is through our policy efforts. As mentioned earlier, we recently launched the updated US Strategy and National Action Plan for WPS in October 2023. We also launched the US Strategy to Prevent and Respond to GBV in 2022, which guides the US government's implementation of $348 million in FY23 foreign assistance investments related to GBV. And a separate women's economic security strategy was also released in January of last year, because um, we know that all of these issues are in fact interlinked. These strategies reflect current global peace and security challenges and opportunities for the US government and how women are well positioned to shape decision-making processes to address them, which includes addressing ongoing conflicts and peace, political and negotiation processes, migration and displacement that often results from these conflicts, GBV, including conflict-related sexual violence, the climate crisis, environmental and food insecurity, the democratic backsliding, corruption and social and economic inequalities, as well as the misuse and abuse of new and emerging technologies contributing to technology-facilitated gender-based violence, which of course was the focus, as you well know, of last year's CSW, and continues to be a high priority to us, as well as clearly in all of the conversations that are occurring at the CSW this year. So we're forever grateful to all of you for your partnership, especially with the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. You are the ones who take great risk to build a more inclusive and safer future. I look forward to listening and learning how we can better support you and your local Women Peace Builders Thank you so much for including me in this vital conversation. I hope we can continue to talk to each other, to learn from each other um, more, I would say, for me to learn from all of you, uh, from what you are doing out there in communities around the world. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Gupta, for these remarks and for sharing the, an overview of the She Wins initiative, which we're so grateful to be a part of and be a co-implementing partner. Now, colleagues, with the excitement, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I was too keen to get started across the way. And so my name is Katrina Leclerc. I'm the program director at the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. I have the honor and privilege of overseeing our programmatic teams in Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. I also want to acknowledge that across the room, we have our senior program director overseeing our work and efforts in Asia Pacific and Eastern Europe, South Caucasus, and Central Asia. Now you'll hear from many of our colleagues, many of our team members, and of course, a lot from our local partners, both in the room and online. I do want to, re uh, to recognize and thank the minister who is here from Papua New Guinea, your excellency. Welcome, thank you for joining us. We're very grateful. And of course, colleagues also from the Ministry 
of gender in Cameroon who are here, and I'd like to acknowledge their presence. So thank you all for being here. But we also know we have several different colleagues and supporters, friends online who are joining us. Now, yes, let's clap. <laughs> Often we take it too seriously. Of course, these are difficult issues, but yes, let's celebrate as well. Now, I have the pleasure of turning the floor over to our co-moderators for the panel discussion, our two wonderful, extravagant, and fantastic program officers from Africa and the Middle East. I'm glad to introduce Simone Bodeziou from Dakar, who will be moderating in partnership with Sana Albanawi from Jordan. Now, over to you. Wonderful women. Merci Katrina. Bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Simone Diou. Je suis chargée de programme au sein du Réseau mondial des femmes bâtisseuses de paix, GMWP. Et c'est un plaisir et un honneur de co-modérer cette session avec ma collègue Sana. Sana, vas-y, tu peux te présenter. Thank you so much, uh, Simone. Uh, this is Sana again, uh, Albanoui from Jordan. And I work as the, the programs officer for the MENA region at the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. Today we will be mixing Arabic and English. So welcome uh, to this uh, event. Over to you, Simon. Merci, Sana. On sent plus tarder, on va commencer ce panel de discussion. Notre auguste panel est composé de femmes artisanes de paix qui travaillent dur pour mettre en œuvre sur le terrain notre stratégie de localisation. Nous avons été sur le terrain avec elles et nous avons vu leur engagement et leur expertise. Ces femmes, on peut le dire, sont les pionnières de la mise en œuvre de la stratégie de localisation des GMWP. Et elles méritent d'être entendues. Leur voix, leur expertise mérite d'être entendue. On va d'abord poser une première question à toutes nos panélistes avant de poser des questions spécifiques. Donc la première question est la suivante. À tous nos panélistes en ligne et sur place, quels sont les principaux problèmes auxquels sont confrontées les femmes, les jeunes et les groupes marginalisés dans votre communauté? Et comment vous voyez la localisation comme un outil permettant d'assurer une action sensible au genre et au conflit pour relever ce défi? Pour répondre à ces questions, je vais d'abord inviter Mme Gertrude Naya de la RDC qui nous joint de Mujimaï, qui est en ligne, pour qu'elle nous donne ses réponses. Bonjour Maman Gertrude, allez-y, vous avez la parole. Bonjour euh, chère Simone, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, moi c'est Gertrude Biayan Daya, je suis euh, congolaise et je travaille euh, au niveau de Mboujimaï, dans la province du Kassai oriental. Je voudrais de prime abord remercier les organisateurs et les organisatrices de cette activité qui nous permet de, qui est une opportunité pour nous de partager avec les décideurs et les praticiens du monde entier notre expérience et les leçons tirées de la mise en œuvre de la résolution 1325 au niveau de la province du Kassai oriental en République démocratique du Congo. Il faut dire que la province du Kassai oriental est située dans la zone centre de la République démocratique du Congo. Elle est souvent confrontée à des conflits récurrents de pouvoir coutumier des conflits intercommunautaires, des conflits fonciers, des conflits de limites de terre avec certaines provinces voisines. Les femmes et les jeunes, ainsi que les groupes marginalisés, sont confrontés aux problèmes tels que la non-tenue euh, des élections. Un instant. OK. Donc, les problèmes auxquels sont confrontés les femmes, les jeunes et les groupes mar marginalisés sont les suivants. La faible représentation dans les institutions, les mécanismes de résolution des con euh, de conflits 
et autres instances de prise de décision. Nous devons épingler aussi l'absence de système d'alerte précoce pour pr prévenir les conflits. La faible prise en charge des victimes et des survivantes des violences sexuelles, des abus sexuels et des violations d'autres droits humains. La non-application correcte de la loi sur les violences sexuelles qui sanctionne les auteurs des violences sexuelles pour au moins cinq ans de prison et au paiement des amendes. Souvent, dans beaucoup de cas, il se passe des arrangements à l'amiable entre les familles avec les OPJ de la justice au détriment souvent des victimes elles-mêmes. Nous devons épingler aussi la pauvreté, le faible pouvoir d'achat des communautés, particulièrement des communautés qui sont touchées par les conflits. Nous citons également la non prise en compte de la dimension genre dans la gestion et la résolution des conflits. Il y a la faible promotion de l'autonomisation socio-économique des femmes et des, des adolescents et jeunes filles qui sont victimes des conflits. Il faut aussi noter la faible connaissance de la 1325 et des résolutions connexes sur FPS et JPS et les autres instruments juridiques de promotion des droits humains. Euh, pour nous, nous considérons que la localisation de la résolution 1325 est vraiment un outil qui permet d'assurer euh, une, une action sensible à la dimension genre et à la résolution des conflits par le fait que la 1325 prend en compte tous les problèmes concernant les femmes en lien avec la paix et la sécurité avant, pendant et après les conflits. Euh, il faut signaler aussi que la résolution 1325, d'après notre expérience, a permis la prise de conscience des, des décideurs et leur engagement à une plus grande représentation des femmes et leur participation à la décision dans les instances, dans les institutions et les mécanismes de résolution et prévention des conflits. Voilà un peu ce que je peux présenter pour euh, cette première question. Merci, maman. Maintenant, je vais adresser cette même question, la question des défis à Sali, Sali Mounien, qui nous vient du Cameroun. Elle est la fondatrice et la directrice exécutive de Common Action for Gender Development, Comagen. Sali, tu as la parole. On n'entend pas le son. Pouvez-nous nous aider avec le son, s'il vous plaît? In Cameroon, power structures from the smallest unit of the community right up to national governance plans are largely exclusive. This is because um, women, youth, uh, the minority group, the marginalized group are not included in these uh, power structures. This is because our community is um, having a history of patriarchy where it is male dominated and leadership is largely in the hands of the male. The situation has made that this very important group who constitute a majority of the national population are excluded in a decision making where their needs and aspirations are not factored in a, the decision that is going on. 
most of them have lost faith in governance. Most people do not find themselves in part of the structures and they, their patriotic levels are low. We can largely attribute this to be a base cause for the ongoing conflict that is existing in Cameroon within the English speaking regions for the past several years. And this also contributes and makes it easy for young people to get easily radicalized and they pick up arms and join terrorist movements. This has gone ahead for long, but luckily there is the localization strategy that we are currently ruling out in Cameroon. The localization strategy, which I consider as a, balance, a power balancer that balances existing power imbalances that constitute the dynamics of leadership in our country, is what we have been using to provide uh, a gender-sensitive response to our existing problems within the country. In Cameroon, we are, on, we are rolling the localization strategy in two regions of the country within four subdivisions where it has given an opportunity for community members as localization is a multi-stakeholder process to come together without any biases and analyze the existing problems in a gender sensitive manner and provide gender transformative solutions to these problems. This has really helped the community because community members now own and discuss the process. If we are discussing Merci beaucoup à Sally pour cette réponse. Maintenant, je vais donner la parole à Sana pour les autres questions. Thank you so much, Simon. Please allow me uh, to welcome Ms. Lenji Biswer, uh, Voice for Change from PNG. Uh, so the question is, what are the primary, primary issues facing women, youth, and marginalized groups in your community? And how do you see localization as a tool for ensuring gender responsive and conflict sensitive action to address these challenges. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, Ray Fast. I would like to thank, um, it is an honor to have my Vice Minister with us here today with um, the department heads that are leading the work of GBV in my country. Um, as usual, it's our custom, we clap to the, our guests. I would ask you to give them three. Claps, please. One, two, three. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lane Chair and I represent Voice for Change. As I sit here, I am very humbled with this opportunity. Uh, Papua New Guinea is a very culturally diverse country. Uh, to give you a brief background and a rundown before we look at how the localization process is happening in my country. Um, we have an estimate of 1,330 plus culturally diverse tribal groups. Each of these tribal groups, they come with over 833 plus different languages. Development in my um, country is a constant struggle because each of these cultural um, groups, they come with their own traditions and cultural way of doing things. Tribal fighting and tribal conflict is a culture of the Highlands region. When we say culture, it's an excuse, but it is still happening and as our ambassador has stated. We currently have a huge crisis that is happening in one of the Highlands provinces. We are yet to recognize the tribal conflict is a humanitarian crisis. It is not recognized as a humanitarian crisis. Traditional methods of peace building and conflict mediation do, are still very prevalent. We rely on these methods to maintain the peace and safety of our communities. Papua New Guinea is also a geographically uh, challenging country to work in the geographical context, not conducive for development work. The cost of development work in my country is expensive. Uh, the fitting team for the CSW on poverty. Poverty is one contributing factor to lawlessness. It's a social factor that affects people. It leads to certain social disturbances in the community. The localization process is taken on board by which the change and it's piloted in 18 communities in two provinces in the Highlands region. The two provinces are Chihuahua province and Western Islands province. One province really faces the kind of cultural conflict that the other provinces face. For example, in the Bayer River district, 
The community is ruling out that localization process has been through a conflict for 20 years. The presence of firearms in our communities there in households is like cooking utensils and um, eating utensils. Every house has a gun. Kids grow up in the presence of small harms in their homes. The localization is utilized in a way that we take it on board to do prevention. And I am proud to say that uh, it is being very accepted in the communities. Communities have realized that it is a necessary and urgent need now to have local laws that will keep the safety and security in the communities because tribal fights in the islands province comes at a very expensive cost. We are required to make compensation for the loss. And the Human Development Index states that we have over 40% of the population living below poverty line. Women birth a burden off, contributing towards peace. Apart from meeting all the domesticated and um, financial support for conflicts in their own community. Our approach that we are taking, we are encouraging communities to do all of their own community bylaws. It is not a new approach. It is taking our national constitution and aligning it with local and traditional laws. For instance, traditional laws have a strong penalty that you cannot steal from another person. Enter Christianity, religion, one of the Ten Commandments of the Bible says that you do not steal. And then we have our constitution. It also criminalizes the practice of stealing. Communities are encouraged to develop laws that will keep the peace and safety in the community. It is very gender responsive because women have been given the opportunity to hear their concerns about social issues that are affecting them in the communities. Um, I spend, for instance, every Friday, I have a huge traditional house that sings about 250 men from the seven communities that I work with. And we have these conversations. We do not look at how it's affecting them. We look at how it's impacting the kids. So the approach for localization is taken to the lens of children's rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I will switch to Arabic. Bahab Arahab Bizamile was a dear and a stada Hinda Miran, where he are a Masul to Sharak and Nasawiya Fi Munatamat Mubadar Masar as Salam, Fil Yaman. Was so Al Al Amua, Mahia, Aham Al Kadaya, what the Hadiyat Leti to Wajif and Nisa. وكيف ترين جية 13-25 كآلية لضمان خطوات مستجبة للنوع الاجتماعي ومراعية للنزاعات من أجل معالجة هذه التحديات طبعاً صباح الخير Good morning It's really a pleasure to be with you all today learning from all of this experience So I will speak in Arabic <laughs> أولا نريد التحدث عن جهود مبادرة مسار السلام ونشكر أكيد شركائنا جي إن دبليو بي إس جي دبليو آي مؤسسة مبادرة مسار السلام هي مؤسسة غير ربحية مسجلة في كندا لدينا مكتب في اليمن ويتم إدارتها من نساء يمنيات في الداخل وفي الخارج من الشمال وأيضا من الجنوب تعرضنا لتجارب النزوح لدينا ثلاث برامج رئيسية وهي السلام النسوي والتمكين وتمكين النساء والقيادة النسوية وحماية النساء وحقوقهن وضمن جهودنا قمنا بإعداد خارطة الطريق للسلام خارطة الطريق النسوي للسلام شارك بها أكثر من ألف شخص سبعين في المئة منهم نساء تشاركنا بإعدادها مع مؤسسات مجتمع مدني نسوية شبابية وأحزاب ومكونات السياسية والوسطاء والوسطات المحليين والمحليات وقد أشاد بها مكتب المبعوث واستفاد منها كما أننا نقدم الدعم للسكرتارية الفنية لشبكة التضامن النسوية التي قدمت أعضاءها أكثر من إحاطة لمجلس الأمن 
والتي تشمل أكثر من 200 امرأة قيادية وتشمل نوع تنوع كبير من الحزبيات والمستقلات والأقليات والمهمشات من أغلب المحافظات من كل البلاد وفي الخارج ويشكلنا قوة مؤثرة ودافعة نحو السلام وقد كان تضامن في بداية تأسيسه قد بمشاركة 70 امرأة وثيقة لأجندة السلام والأمن في 2016 وقدمها لمجلس الأمن في جلسة غير رسمية عبر وزارة الخارجية السويد أنذاك وعبر يو أن ومن وشبكة ويل وطالبنا بإعداد الخطة من الدولة والمميز بشبكة التضامن المسوية أن لدينا قيادات نسائية في الحكومة تشاركنا بإعداد هذه الوثيقة وتم تدشين الخطة الوطنية في عام 2020 والتي شملت أربعة محاور والفجوات ايضا اضافتها كانت حسب ما ما اذكر حول المدافعات عن حقوق الانسان وتجنيد الاطفال وقد ظهرت حاجه الى الحاجه الى التوطين او الموائمه اجنده السلام والامن على مستوى المحلي مهم لردم الفجوات واعاده صياغتها لدعم الخطه الوطنيه للمراه والسلام والامن التي تمت سابقا. <تصفيق> فقد غيرت الحرب في اليمن الواقع السياسي وجذور الصراع وجذور الصراع اليوم لا يوجد قبول لمركزيه القرار وهناك دفع نحو توطين القرارات المركزيه لتدير كافه المناطق نفسها بنفسها وتدير مواردها وبالتالي فان وجود خطه محليه امر بالغ الاهميه لضمان تنفيذ السلطات المحليه بالشراكه مع المجتمع المدني والنساء لاجنده النساء والسلام والامن بحسب اولويات واحتياجات النساء في كل منطقه استخدام منهجية كونفدرالية وتختلف احتياجات النساء بفئاتهن والشباب بفئاتهم والفئات المهمشة وذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة ذوي الهمم والأقليات الدينية والمذهبية التي يتعرضوا لانتهاكات حقوقية في البلد وبشكل عام فإن المشترك بين الفئات هو تأثيرهم بسوء الخدمات الأساسية وعدم الإتصال في تسليم الرواتب وفقدان المصادر الدخل وصعوبة المعيشة والانهيار الاقتصادي والتدهور المعيشي وارتفاع الاسعار وزواج الصغيرات والضحايا الزواج المبكر عندما يتعلق الامر بالقيادات النسائية فهن يناظرن من اجل عمل تغيير حقيقي في كسب الحقوق المكتسبة سابقا والتي تم تجاهلها في وقتنا الحالي الان حيث تم تشكيل حكومة لا توجد فيها نساء في عام 2020 وقد كان ذلك تراجع كبير عما كان في السابق بالنسبه للنساء. وقد اكتسبت الحركه النسائيه والنسويه قوه كبيره اثناء الحرب عبر تشكيل التحالفات ومنها شبكه التضامن النسوي آه ولم يكن هناك فقط التضامن النسوي ايضا شبكات اخرى آه وايضا تعقد هناك آه اجتماعات سنويه ودوريه خلال القمه السنويه التي تشارك فيها اكثر من 200 امراه وايضا شارك فيها رجال وصناع قرار. يتم في عدن ويتم فيه وضع أولويات النساء ومساءلة صناع القرار حول التقدم في دعم حقوقهن وضمن مشروع التوطين خطة السلام والأمن الذي تشاركنا فيه كمؤسسة مبادرة مساء السلام على الجي ام دبليو بي فقد استهدف التوطين لأجندة السلام والأمن في أربع محافظات وهي العاصمة عدن أبين شبوة وحضرموت وقمنا بعمل دراسة مسحية لوضع لوضع وفهم الاحتياجات والأولويات وأبرز ما نتج عن هذه الدراسة أولا مجال أولا في مجال جرائم الجرائم المرتكبة ضد النساء والتي لا يجرمها القانون وتشمل وتشمل الختان وهو تشويه الأعضاء التناسلية للإناث والاتجار بالبشر والاغتصاب الزوجي والمغتصبون الذين يتزوجون ضحاياهم قد يفلتوا من العقاب. وايضا تحتوي القوانين اليمنيه على العديد من الاحكام التمييزيه ضد النساء ولا سيما قانون الجنائيه وقوانين الاحوال الشخصيه. وايضا يعترف الدستور بحقوق النساء ومساواتها الا ان غموضه يسمح باستمرار هذه الممارسات التمييزيه مما يمي... مما يعزز عدم المساواه بين الجنسين الراسخه في المجتمع. Thank you so much, Hind. What a beautiful uh, overview about your work uh, as Peace Track Initiative. I will be just reaffirming a few important points that you raised. One is that the NAP in Yemen, which was endorsed in 2020, failed to capture some of the priorities and needs of different uh, provinces and areas in Yemen. And this is where 
the localization strategy comes as a, as a need to translate and to amplify the voices of different groups in Yemen. And it is like an, a space where different contexts can provide their priorities and needs to be translated in the local action plans. Also, you talked about the, uh, the gap within the legislation uh, when it comes to the empowerment of women in Yemen. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, this uh, uh, overview. Then over to you, Simon. Thank you, thank you, Sana. Alors maintenant, euh, nous allons repasser la parole à Madame Jatrud pour des questions bien spécifiques. Donc, euh, pour cette première ronde, vous avez entendu les défis, les problèmes dans nos différentes régions, dans les différents pays, dans les différentes provinces. Maintenant, la question adressée à Madame Jatrud. Euh, est la suivante. En RDC, où on localise déjà les résolutions femmes, paix et sécurité depuis un certain temps, et où on a commencé à localiser euh, l'agenda jeunesse, paix et sécurité, quels sont les défis et les réussites que vous avez connus, notamment euh, à Kilenge et à Moujimaï, et quelles recommandations ou leçons de succès, pourriez-vous partager avec les OEC locales qui sont, en, qui sont euh, devant et qui mettent en œuvre euh, le processus de localisation? Vous avez sept minutes pour répondre aux deux questions. La parole est à vous, Jérôme Jatrud. Excusez-moi, le micro était Excusez fermé. Donc, je disais que nous avons réalisé euh, la localisation pendant une période où le processus électoral intervenait. Euh, pendant la même période-là, il y a eu euh, des mouvements, des remplacements membres des gouvernements. Il y a eu également des changements dans le chef de certaines autorités, euh, des, des entités territoriales décentralisées. Ce qui nous a un peu causé du tort, en ce sens que il y a des activités que nous voulions faire, mais qui n'ont pas pu être faites au moment voulu à cause de ces changements. Euh, notamment, la présentation des membres du comité de pilotage auprès de gouverneurs de province afin euh, d'obtenir un arrêté d'institutionnalisation des comités euh, de pilotage de la 1325, aussi bien au niveau provincial qu'au niveau local. Donc, ça a un peu perturbé notre programme. Euh, la deuxième chose, c'est qu'avec les changements de ces autorités, au niveau de la commune de Chilénie, nous n'avons pas pu euh, désigner euh, un membre qui devait provenir du conseil euh, communal parce que les élections de, des conseillers communaux n'ont pas encore eu lieu. Donc, on a fait les élections seulement au niveau des chefs-lieux de province, mais pas dans les milieux euh, ruraux, ce qui nous a un peu perturbés pour, en ce qui concerne les membres du comité de pilotage de, de Chile. Euh, comme autre défi, c'est par rapport aux moyens pour réaliser certaines activités, parce que nous avons eu comme problème que certaines activités qui, qui étaient vraiment nécessaires pour euh, la réussite de la localisation n'avaient pas été prises en compte dans le budget, ce qui nous a amené à faire un réaménagement euh, budgétaire. Euh, en ce qui concerne euh, ce réaménagement budgétaire, nous avons surtout mis l'accent sur la couverture médiatique et les supports de visibilité de l'activité, parce qu'il est évident que euh, 
euh, les médias jouent un grand rôle dans la diffusion, dans le, le reportage euh, des activités. Par rapport à la mise en œuvre, à la mise sur pied des comités de pilotage, il avait été prévu la tenue uniquement de simples réunions. Mais sur le terrain, nous avions estimé que il fallait absolument organiser des ateliers de renforcement de capacité des, des membres de, de ces comités pour leur donner les orientations et sur le rôle euh, qu'on attendait de le rôle qu'ils devaient jouer euh, dans la mise en œuvre de la résolution 1325 au niveau de la province. Alors, ce que nous pouvons enregistrer comme réussite, cette, cette activité a vraiment attiré l'attention et a connu l'intérêt et la participation des autorités locales, aussi bien politico-administratives que traditionnelles. Ces autorités à l'issue des ateliers de localisation, ont même pris des engagements pour justement euh, assurer la mise en œuvre de la 1325. Nous considérons comme réussite aussi euh, la mise en place d'un comité provincial de pilotage au niveau de la province et un comité local de pilotage dans la commune de Chilini. À l'issue de ces, de ces comités, nous sommes arrivés à élaborer un plan d'action euh, opérationnel pour la province et un plan d'action local pour, euh, pour la commune de Chilini. Nous avons, nous pouvons également noter... On manque un peu de oui. temps. Est-ce que vous pouvez du... Vous dites Pouvez-vous juste nous donner une ou deux recommandations euh, Ok. On... On manque un peu de temps. Merci. D'accord. Alors, en termes de recommandations, euh, nous pouvons dire que il faut absolument que les jeunes puissent d'abord organiser des focus groups pour euh, intéresser toutes les catégories euh, des populations et que euh, la formation des comités de pilotage doivent être faite pour donner vraiment euh, les orientations du travail qu'ils auront à faire. Et comme euh, pour atterrir, je voudrais vraiment, euh, je voudrais vraiment demander hein, avec insistance auprès de tous ces de de Gender Youpi, donc les femmes artisanes de paix et auprès de toutes les tous les hommes et pris de de bonne volonté pour que nous puissions solliciter auprès des Nations Unies auprès des des différents pays euh, des décideurs de ce monde notamment les États-Unis la France euh, l'Angleterre nous voulons demander vraiment la solidarité pour que cette guerre qui est menée à l'aide de la République démocratique du Congo puisse s'arrêter. Parce qu'elle nous a produit des millions de morts. Il y a des femmes qui sont déplacées, qui sont violées, même les jeunes filles réduites en esclavage sexuel et des enfants qui n'ont jamais connu la paix qui sont nés dans la guerre et qui grandissent dans la guerre. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes à plus ou moins 120 000 personnes déplacées qui, qui vivent dans une situation euh, humanitaire vraiment très déplorable. Donc, euh, je voudrais vraiment que nous puissions euh, mettre tous nos efforts ensemble et joindre nos efforts pour que ce pillage de minerais qui, qui cause ce qui est à la, à la base de cette guerre, puisse s'arrêter. Et ainsi, si la paix revient en République démocratique du Congo, ça sera vraiment le plus grand succès de la localisation de la résolution 1325. J'ai dit et je vous remercie. 
Merci beaucoup, vraiment, j'ai fait pour ce, pour ces recommandations. Merci pour les applaudissements. Nous avons, oh, bien entendu, les succès. Et nous, au sein de l'équipe de DNW, on peut en témoigner. On était sur le terrain, on a vu votre engagement et on a vu les succès. Comme elle l'a dit, la province du Kassai a déjà drafté euh, son plan d'action local. Et maintenant, on a même, au sein de Chilengue et de Mujimai, des plans d'action locaux qui vont être validés. Donc, on voit les succès. Merci beaucoup. Je vais passer la parole à Sally, puisqu'on est en train de perdre un peu de temps. Euh, Sally, euh, dans le contexte du Cameroun, comment la localisation contribue-t-elle à renforcer Oui, à des consignes. Et quels sont les outils qu'on utilise pour fournir et renforcer les, les efforts existants pour lutter notamment contre les VBG Rapidement, merci. Localisation in Cameroon. Localisation has been a process which is a bottom-up approach where the local population gets ownership of the whole process. So the localization that we are unrolling in Cameroon has contributed greatly in building social cohesion. Why do I say so? In our community, we do not have a culture of dialogue before now. It's always a question of two stratas, those who are in power and those who are following it. With the localization that we are introducing in this community, is breaking the barriers of uh, to dialogue. It's also granted access to governance where the local population can discuss with those who are in leadership. For instance, the localization process that we have carried out in Malinyonga, in Bameda 2 subdivision, in Santa and in Marwa, it has given the opportunity when we institute the local steering committees for people to talk with their local council authorities, where we call them the local authorities or regional local authorities, where development plans and decision making that affects the common person comes. The beauty of this localization process is, since it is a multi-stakeholder process, we have developed the culture of dialogue where women, youth, the elderly, the young people living with disability, those in power like in government, traditional authorities and religious authorities, they sit together in one room and analyze the situation of their community in a way that issues of gender are no longer seen as those things that they are bringing on them, but they see them as community problems that need to be addressed. So going forward, these kinds of women, uh, local peace builders activities have brought uh, acceptance and inclusion within the communities. I will go further to cite that with the localization process that we start most especially with mapping of actors and their initiatives they have carried out, it has given an opportunity for us to look at the and valorize the incredible work that local women peace builders are doing in their communities in such a way that we build on these on initiatives while we do the localization process. And this uh, has given the people ownership of the process because governance now is now in the hands of the people. They decide what they want. Within this localization process, we see that we valorize and map actors. Then we have an opportunity to discuss and dialogue with the local authorities to decide how much can be allocated from the budget. That is either the budget of the local councils or the national budget, which is an important aspect. We also have the opportunity to either develop a policy within these structures or call for laws that has to be implemented or develop a local action plan. This has been very fruitful to the localization process of the Women, Peace and Security. Merci beaucoup, Asali. Merci d'avoir montré que au Cameroun, la localisation est en train de renforcer la cohésion sociale à travers une approche participative et inclusive. Sana, you have, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Simone. Uh, Ms. Menji, again, we have two questions. Uh, how do you see the localization of uh, WP as a strategy supporting both for changes work, translating national policies into local realities? For example, PNG's national strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence. And the second question is, how do, you, how do these efforts tie into other related international strategies, such as the U.S. strategy for, to prevent conflict 
and promote stability 10 year strategic plan for, for PNG. The floor is yours. Thank you. So in three minutes, let's go like a racetrack on Formula One. <laughs> um, I would like, uh, my government has taken a um, huge strides in addressing gender-based violence and implementing policies at the level. Um, at the national level, the government as a national GBV um, secretary has established. Uh, for the first time since independence, they have been, uh, we have been given 9 million, you know, which is a lot of money to a group that is working on GBV. We have a permanent committee on gender equality and women's um, empowerment. We have a national gender strategy that has four objectives. The localization process fits into the four objectives because from the national GBV strategy, the government has ensured that we have to be forming your GBV secretaries, voice for changes, working with communities to develop district and local level GBV um, action plan to tie to the national policies. Number two, um, our localization process is taking our constitution and localizing it into our local context with our traditional laws guided by principles of morale, doing what is right, because it's the right thing to do. Um, Voice for Change works with communities to impart human rights training and legal aid to ensure that institutions and agencies that are promoting and protecting individuals in the communities are aware of what they are mandated to do and decisions to consider the safety and security of our women and children. Our way forward is to have a WPS uh, national action plan after the secretary, uh, the state secretary comes in May to Papua New Guinea to launch the community bylaws for the 18 communities that have been taking uh, the piloting the localization process. It is an achievement that we are very proud of because we believe that the community bylaws is the way forward to meet with all these policies. We have been working with a top top approach that now we're looking at community approaches to connect all these uh, processes with the national policies that we have in place. If you do have any questions about our strategies, please, we I have the national coordinator for the National GBV Secretariat sitting with us here today. And we have the consultative implement, uh, implementation and monitoring council national that also was responsible in ensuring that the government does implement the policies. They are the uh, watchdog for these national policies ensuring that it works. Uh, to conclude, I would like to say that uh, our localization process was very, very simple. In one community, we do identify ourselves to a tribal group, but we have identified also that we do associate with different groups. For example, uh, young men abusing marijuana are totally separate, though they belong to the same community group. They identify them separate from um, young women who have been divorced or have gone through marital problems. Then we have certain groups that are indulged in binging or the excessive alcohol consumptions. And then we have different groups that gamble. So in total, on an average, you come to one community in the islands of Papua New Guinea, you have an average of 24 to 26 different groups of people in the community. And it gives you a balance to assess how they view themselves as part of the community. And they have all taken on board the approach to suggest one law from their community that they can uphold and it is a community initiative and we are very very excited to launch this loss with the presence of our ambassador when she arrives in may thank you thank you so much uh and amran مرة أخرى الأسئلة كالتالي كيف ترين أن التوطين يعزز مشاركة المرأة في صنع القرار في اليمن والسؤال الثاني وعلى وجه الخصوص كيف يمكن للتوطين أن يتيح زيادة إشراك المرأة المحلية في عملية السلام في اليمن ويضمن نتائج أكثر استدامة نتيجة لذلك يعني حاول أعملها كده يعني كده مع بعض أوكي أولا أحب أشكر شركائنا في الأرض مؤسسة أكرون للحقوق والحريات الذي يعمل معنا من سنوات طويلة مع مبادرة مسار السلام وحقيقة لو ما كانت جهود المشاركة بيننا وبينهم ما كانش قدرنا نستهدف هذه الأربع المحافظات على وجه الخصوص والعمل بشكل مكثف 
الموائمة كما يحبد طبعا هذا المصطلح الناس اللي في الأرض أو الجهات الحكومية للمصطلح توطين يعد مشكلة الآن في واقع النزاع والصراع في داخل البلد المؤامة تدعم تطوير خطة محلية مستجيبة لواقع المناطق المختلفة وتراعي الاحتياجات والاحتياجات والأولويات التي تواجه النساء في هذه المناطق وتعطي المجتمع المحلي من القيادات ومجتمع مدني والنساء والمشاركة في صنع القرار وتدعم الخطة الوطنية بحيث تركز على الأهداف العامة ولكن مع تحديد مع تحديد الأهداف الخاصة وخصوصية كل منطقة قمنا من خلال هذا المشروع بدعم السلطة المحلية بتشكيل فرق محلية تنفيذية للخطط المحلية والتي تم تشكيلها بقرارات رسمية أصدرت من ديوان المحافظات في المحافظات المستهدفة والتي تمثل الالتزام الدولة والسلطة المحلية بالشراكة مع المجتمع المدني للدفع بهذه الأجندة وتنفيذها بشكل فعلي كما أنها تساعد في مراجعة الخطة الوطنية التي تتماشى أيضا مع الاحتياجات المحلية وقد شملت توصيات المسح الميداني الذي قمنا العمل به قبل تنفيذ مشروع الورش أهمية مراعاة وجود الإحصاءات التي تبين الفرق بين النساء والرجال وأهمية فهم منظور النساء تجاه البرامج والخطط والسياسات وزيادة الوعي بحقوق النساء وإنشاء سياسات متكاملة وشاملة وتقديم الدعم لمشاركة وتمكين النساء في جهود بناء السلام ايضا المواءمه مواءمه اجنده النساء والسلام والامن في اليمن يقدم نهجا استراتيجيا للتغلب على التحديات وتعزيز مشاركه النساء وتعزيز السلام المستدام من خلال معالجه العوائق القانونيه والمؤسسيه والاجتماعيه ويسخر الامكانات الكامله للقياده النسويه في عمليه صنع القرار وضمان مجتمع اكثر شمولا وانصافا ويتيح فرص المشاركه للنساء كعدوى فاعله في اللجان التوجيهيه والفرق المحليه لاجنده النساء والسلام المعده من خلال الخطط المحليه. ايضا تتيح الموائمه مشاركه اكبر عدد من النساء المحليات في عمليه ايضا السلام واكثر استدامه في هذه المحافظات المستهدفه. آه كما آه كيف آه سوف تكون هناك مشاركة آه مشاركة النساء كعضو فاعل في اللجان التوجيهية وفي الفرق المحلية أيضا وأيضا من خلال إعطاء الأولوية للمشاركة ووجهة النظر للنساء المحليات في تلك المحافظات آه وأيضا في تحقيق نتائج أكثر استدامة آه عبر هذه المحافظات وشكرا So thank you so much, Hind, for uh, emphasizing the importance of localization as a tool to develop local action plans that are responsive to the realities of the communities in Yemen and, of course, to their needs and priorities by including uh, community leaders, civil society, and, of course, women as decision makers in the designing phase of these local action plans in a participatory approach uh, or manner. Uh, also, uh, the mapping uh, paved the way for us to understand uh, as GNWP and our local partners in Yemen. And thank you so much for your efforts to understand what is the reality in Yemen, what are the gaps and what are the achievements, also the challenges when it comes to the women, peace and security implementation uh, in Yemen. So after we heard the uh, excellent speakers, I think if we look at our work as a ship, we need to ensure that the elements of sailing are there so we can sail on the right track towards the change. And one of them, of course, is localization. Thank you so much uh, today and over to you, Katrina. Thank you so much, Sana. And again, a big round of applause for our speaker. Now, colleagues, we have three respondents who will intervene. I'm giving you two minutes to be able to share some reflections with us. And first, we have Ms. Signe Guro Gilen, which is the Special Envoy on Women, Peace, and Security of Norway, a longtime partner and co chair of the board of the Women, Peace, and Humanitarian Action Compact with GNWP. Thank you. When, uh, when we were launching the chairmanship, the very the two of us <laughs> on the podium. <laughs> nice to show. <laughs> um, 
Well, the local women network are key to conflict prevention and the first responders to crisis. Strong networks bolster over joint efforts. And um, the Women, Peace, and Security Humanitarian Action Compact is at least a, a network. It's a platform for networking. And um, I, that's why I'm sort of sent yes to take this key uh, summary today. Uh, I, I hear uh, from Yemen uh, and the, the issue of national action plan. Uh, you know, Yemen developed a national action plan um, in, in quite difficult circumstances where the consultation was really a little bit difficult, but I think that the fact that the government um, committed to our action plan the 6th of December 2021 um, led to a platform where you could actually discuss their obligations and, 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 and it's a dialogue going on around that platform, which I think is quite good. <laughs> um, and as you say, they, they should, uh, you are developing um, throughout the, the different context of Yemen because it's divided in, in uh, due to the war. It's it's difficult to travel. So yeah, but but I think the fact that the government is um, is committed to a plat to to a, to a national action plan create that space of discourse, and that's very important. So uh, it could have started better, but it's actually ended by. Can I yes. respond to that yes. specific? With the yeah. uh, when, before before we starting the, the mapping, the thing uh, when our partners and also us as a BTI, we went to do the mapping and we started questioning or to ask the people there, what do you know about um, WBS agenda, the resolution 1325, do you know the NAP, the National Action Plan, the response was from the local authorities, we don't know anything in the different uh, governance, which is, it was for us like the government work on this and how they couldn't deliver the implementation of the NAB to the other governance. So this is the first lack that we, we faced. And then they said, this NAB, it's not representing us. We don't have our voices in this NAB. So we need to start to write our NABs and be included. To, this NAB should be inclusive. So the localization workshop really helped us to work in this method and each governance have their own traditions, their own um, things to want to share when it comes to uh, to the NAP. Yes. So the platform is there to discuss. That's <laughs> what my, that, that was my argument. <laughs> um, and and the, the other thing I want to touch on, uh, and I, I heard uh, several of the, of the presenters was talking about this localization of the national action plans. I also want to say that uh, for us, we have just uh, developed our fifth plan and we have also localized it in some sense because we have made it national and international. In the past, we used to have a, a very much like an open looking perspective from the national action plan, what we did of foreign policy, security policy, development policy, but now we also have this focus on what we do back home for defense, for the total defense, for the judiciary, for climate and environment. Yeah, so so we have also done a little bit on our localization, I would say. Uh, I think that's also important. To, um, so we are not just seen as a donor, it's like the National Action Plan. It's tied to the sustainable development goals and we are all committed to deliver on the, the level development goals and hence it should also be implemented nationally. And I, I know you for Canada, so I think also Canada have gone that direction, yes. which is, I think, also an interesting development. So uh, the third thing I wanted to talk uh, to, to mention is, is, of course, the financing uh, and the resource, um, which is important. Um, and I know that there is a lot of discussions on, on, on this. I mean, in... Um, like in Ukraine, I think the CSOs have received like 0.7% of the support mm -hmm. to Ukraine. So, you know, so it's it's a very small percentage of the very big mobilization of funds who goes to the local uh, NGOs, uh, but quite a lot through international NGOs uh, to local NGOs. But, uh, but this uh, direct support is an is, uh, is issue. Um, um, and I just want to mention the Women, Peace and Humanitarian Fund, um, because I think there the UN through the Trust Fund are trying to do something about these uh, stages of, of, of financing, where they 
where they um, uh, identify and 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 uh, support directly, and and it might also do something with the whole country pro uh, you know the country the humanitarian country programs and 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 the way they look at the, that that humanitarian funds. Um, so that was uh, the financing, and then. Um, yeah, and then I think also if you look at the different the kind of, of networks you have, uh, you have the Women, Peace and Humanitarian Action Compact, you have the uh, you have the um, uh, network of mediators, who have also had this global alliance for different regional networks of mediators, you have the Women, Peace and uh, Security Focal Point Network, and I really think you need to mobilize on all these platforms. Uh, uh, if you should uh, make a change, and I, I, we are going towards 2025 and 25 years of national uh, of, of women peace and security, and it's uh, it is a very dairy situation globally speaking on security. Not because we women peace and security agenda didn't succeed, but we did, but we haven't received enough space, so we have to take the space. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Signe. And yes, we have to take the space, we have to make up the space, we have to change the space, all of the things to yeah. rethink how we conceive space for decision making. Okay. Next, I'd like to uh, give the floor over to our colleague, Stella Ateki Dogima, who is the director of the Women Empowerment and Family Center in Bau from the Ministry of Gender uh, Women's Empowerment and Family of Cameroon for a few reflections. Over to you. There we go. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Minister of Women's Empowerment and the Family for Cameroon, I'm very, very delighted to be here. Permit me, first of all, to congratulate and thank and <laughs> we've been peace builders for organizing such a wonderful conversation for us to, to talk about peace, peace building. And I also want to congratulate Koma Jane. That is one of our foot soldiers on peace building in our community that is in Cameroon. And I want to say they are really doing an extremely great job. So I want to thank them for that. On behalf of the ministry, I will briefly want to look at one or two policies that the ministry has put in place to ensure that the agenda on resolution 1325 is moving on smoothly. First on premise, we the ministry adopted the first national action plan in 2017 for a period of two years, that's from 2018 to 2020. And this um, national um, action plan has uh, uh, three organs. We have the piloting and the orientation committee. We have the national technical coordination committee. We have the regional, divisional, and subdivisional units. And that is why you could hear Sally Bumian says we're doing the localization. We are using the bottom top approach. It's because we have all the stratas from the up to down, and as well as from down to up, which makes the bottom up approach very, very effective. And more to this, we have focal points in all the ministry. We have all focal points, and those focal points have been trained on WSP. And it has really, really been very, very effective. And we're using that route to mainstream gender in various ministries. For example, we use that of mainstream gender in military, in defense forces, in health, in education ministry. And I would like to say that it has been very, very effective. And now looking at the localization, the ministry is working hand in hand with civil society organizations because they were part of drawing the action plan in Cameroon. So the ministry is working hand in hand with different civil society organizations to ensure that the localization is very, very effective. And I'm happy and I'm proud to say that it has really been very, very effective. And again, I'll use this opportunity to thank a um, global network of women peace builders for supporting these initiatives because they have been doing a lot in the field through Comagene. And I also want to reiterate the fact that this approach truly is breaking barriers and it has created 
a culture of dialogue in our community. And in a time like this, where Cameroon is facing challenges in the Northwest and Southwest, and also in the North, where we have the Boko Haram, there is nothing more than having community content conversations, community dialogue, intergenerational dialogue that can help us solve some of these, some of these um, pain, pain and problems that we are facing in the community. So I want to thank you all and I pray that we should put all our efforts more in our community in supporting the effort of localizing women, peace and security in our community. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for agreeing to co-host this with us and for the ongoing political support of the localization of women, peace and security efforts across Cameroon. Now, before we hand over uh, to Dr. Rima Salah for the closing remarks, we have one respondent online, Ani Matundu Mbambi, who is the honorary president of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Africa. Uh, Mama Ani, vous êtes parmi nous, je vous vois. C'est à vous la parole, on vous donne deux minutes pour des réflexions, s'il vous plaît, sur la localisation 1325. On est heureuse que vous soyez parmi nous. La maman ne vous capte pas, est-ce que votre micro est allumé Can you put the floor on so I can see if she's speaking? The what? You remove the interpretation. Ani, on ne vous capte pas du tout. She's in second. We can hear you. On ne vous entend pas. She might do it. No, her microphone doesn't work. Oh, her microphone. Ah, votre microphone n'est pas uh, activé. Mm. It's active, but her, her audio is not connected. Maman Annie, je vous appelle sur le téléphone sur WhatsApp.
Parce que euh, la collecte des données nous donne euh, cette possibilité de voir réellement l'impact de la localisation partout où nous sommes en train de le faire. Et ça peut nous permettre aussi de faire des recherches euh, pour voir euh, où nous sommes nous dans la localisation avec la résolution 325. Et il y a aussi un problème de responsabilité et de rédévabilité. Parce que au niveau local, il faut que les autorités soient responsables pour que cette localisation puisse se passer dans de bonnes conditions et vraiment une appropriation à tous les niveaux euh, et une nutrition des femmes et des jeunes filles puisse être respectée respecté au moment où on fait la localisation. Voilà en gros ce que j'avais à dire concernant cet événement d'aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup à vous, maman. Merci d'avoir été créative et répondu à l'appel. Euh, merci pour votre patience avec les difficultés de réseau et de connexion. Merci beaucoup, maman. Bon, colleagues, without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome our, our wonderful Dr. Rima Salah, who will be providing closing remarks. Dr. Salah is the former Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF and the current Treasurer of uh, the GNWP Board of Directors. And we have the honor of learning with and from you. you. So over to you, Dr. Salah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening. Uh, bon soirée uh, à tous. Uh, to everyone who has joined us from all over the world, in person and online. Uh, all appreciation to Ambassador Rao uh, Gupta uh, and the U.S. Department of State Secretary's Office of Global Women Issues for co-sponsoring this event, as well as Madame Stella Dokihima Etiki and the Cameroon Ministry of Women's Empowerment and the family. Also all appreciation for the inspiring remarks of Ambassador Gupta, and also to thank Ms. Sinye Guru Gillen, Special Envoy for Women, Peace and Security of Norway, who is always with us, and also for her inspiring uh, remarks. Uh, also, thank you all the panelists from Cameroon, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Papua New Guinea, and from Yemen. The discussion we have already not only shed light on the critical issues facing women in conflict zones, but also the importance of implementing the women, peace and security resolutions at local level to encourage local leadership. We heard a lot about local leadership, ownership, and commitment among key stakeholders. Today, we have witnessed the experiences, challenges, and lessons learned of diverse local women, peace builders. Let us be reminded that localization of the Women Peace Security Resolution offers, as we heard today, avenues for the participation of local women, young women, and particularly marginalized communities in shaping the policies that affect their lives. And it works to translate international pledges and commitments into concrete action and legislation. And legislation is the most important part. That's why we are so grateful to have ministers among us because they are the ones who do the legislation. We also, it supports also gender responsive and conflict sensitive local government and promotes collaboration and coordination amongst local authorities and civil society organizations to tailor implementation of the strategies for their unique context and needs. That's what is very important. Now, reflecting on the powerful narrative shared by our panelists, it is clear that the localization of women, peace and security agenda is not merely a theoretical framework, like sometimes we hear at the United Nations and there, 
but a tangible force for positive change in communities everywhere. Their stories of resilience, their courage, and unwavering commitment to peace have underscored the importance of centering local women's voices in conflict resolution and peace building efforts. And you, Madam Ministers and others, you bring their voices here. Who will bring their voices to the United Nations? You have to bring them here to the international community. The video that played also at the outset of this event highlighted many of the successes of the localization strategy over the years. Thanks to the support also of the US Department of State Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues, as well as the expertise and dedication of Global Network for Women Peace Builders, local partners in Cameroon, in DRC, in PNG and in Yemen, we have been able to continue expanding these impact to the new countries and communities under another or uh, initiative called She Wings Initiative. Some of these impacts include, as we heard, in Cameroon, a Global Network for Women Peace Builders and its partners held the first localization workshop and launched local steering committees in the Northwest region, soliciting commitments from the deputy mayor of Bamenda and the mayor of Balin Yunga municipalities. And I have been, uh, when I was in UNICEF, to those municipalities. And I know how difficult it is also to get there. And so building on more than 10 years of localization experience in the DRC, newly formed steering committees have already produced the first draft of local action plan on women, peace, and security in the two local areas of Buji, Mai, and Shilingwe. And also the local steering committee is Papua New Guinea, which have introduced women, peace, and security to more than 2,000 people across tribal communities in the highland region and are preparing to launch community bylaws in several districts. Thank you very much. In Yemen, the launch of the localization of women peace and security strategy inspired the deputy governor of Shabwa to announce that his administration will appoint a woman officer to the executive office and prioritize discussions on women's empowerment for in forthcoming council meetings. And this is very, very important. As we move forward, let us carry with us. It's a very important session today and very rich session. So we import with us the lessons learned and the recommendation put forth by our distinguished speakers, let us redouble our efforts to ensure that local women and young women are not only included, but also empowered to lead in peace building processes and decision making at all levels. Let us strive together to, for greater coordination and collaboration between governments civil society and international organizations to support the localization of the women, peace and security agenda. In closing, let us commit ourselves to being the champions of change and the allies of women, peace builders everywhere, wherever they are. Thank you again to everyone who has contributed to the success of this event. Together, let us continue to work a future where peace, justice, and quality prevail. No peace without justice, no justice without peace, and equality forever. Thank you. Thank you. Together, let us always remember that together we are stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone who has joined us in person. Thank you for those of you who have joined us online. Thank you again 
to the U.S. Department of State Secretary's Office on Global Women's Issues for coordinating this with us and the Cameroonian Ministry for the Promotion of Women and Family. We are grateful for this partnership and we are very grateful for this platform for local women peace builders from Cameroon, DRC, PNG, and Yemen to be able to share these best practices. On behalf of the whole team at GNWP, thank you. Merci. Gracias. Shukran. Definimos.